just want to thank you all for having me here this morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Norman, uh, who I just met, and uh, Bernie, who was inspiring. And uh, I certainly want to thank Jackie. She facilitated my uh, visit here today. And Marion, who I've known for years, who uh, is just a great person and uh, is hosting uh, me today. And I just think it's great. I feel so uh, blessed and, uh, and honored, really, to be speaking to you folks today. I kind of want to, in the spirit of, of what we're talking about today, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey. Hope you'll bear with me. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is uh, in a book that I just finished writing, coincidentally, <laughs> I've been working on for some time. It's called uh, Proving Ground. And what I'm going to say is uh, much more completely and coherently uh, reproduced there. Uh, and if you go to provinggroundbook.com, you'll see all about it. That's the end of the commercial. Um, you know, in, in the process of uh, writing this book, I had to um, kind of research my own family history a little bit, and I learned some things that I didn't know. You know, we, have, we all have relatives, and they tell us a little bit about the family here and there, but until you pull it together, you really don't see what happened. Uh, my folks, like probably most of the black folks here, my parents are descended from slaves. And uh, I didn't know about that whole history, and I'm not going to recount all of it here. But suffice it to say that my mother and father were in Albany, Georgia. My father was interested in electronics. He served in World War II uh, in the uh, Signal Corps, and he was actually stationed in the Aleutian Islands. And uh, my mother went to a nursing school in Atlanta at a place called the Grady Colored School of Nursing. And uh, when she got her nursing degree, she went back to Atlanta. And my father, when he got out of the Army, up, excuse me, went back to Albany, Georgia. And my father, when he got out of the uh, Army, he went back to Albany. And my mother was working in his hospital one night, Phoebe Hospital. And it had a, a white side and a black side, as was common in those days. It was a nice brick building on the white side and a wood frame structure on the black side. And there was a corridor joining those two sides of the building. And there was a bathroom near the corridor. And, but it was a white bathroom. And the colored bathroom was all the way in the black section, the bowels of the hospital. My mother was working near that white bathroom one night. And she decided that she was going to just duck in there and use the bathroom real quick and come out. And one of her coworkers saw her and uh, reported her to her superiors. And she was severely reprimanded. And that's when she decided. I'm getting the heck out of the South. I'm moving to Michigan. And so my father and mother moved to Flint, Michigan. And if they hadn't done that, my whole life probably would have been very different. Because when they arrived in Flint, it was a boom town. Uh, many of you know about Flint because of his recent history. Maybe some of you have seen Roger and me about how uh, General Motors has abandoned Flint and how bad things are. But in the days when I was growing up in Flint in the 50s and 60s, it was an absolute boom town, one of the best places to live and grow up in the country. And uh, not only that, but at the time, uh, we, uh, Jackie referred to Thurgood Marshall, the Brown versus Board of Education, and so forth. The Civil Rights Movement was in full bloom at that time. And we were so full of optimism as kids growing up. We saw things changing. And our parents saw things changing. And in addition to that, it was a time of technological opening because the transistor had been invented. Everybody was carrying around little transistor radios. The Russians had launched Sputnik in the late 50s. And so there was this fever in the United States about, we got to catch up. We, got, we can't let the Russians you know, beat us to space. We can't let the Russians beat us technologically. And so due to that, there was all this science education going on in the schools. And science fairs became very popular. I know some of you have probably participated in some of those uh, science fairs. And that's really where my first introduction to technology came. Because when I was in the fourth grade, uh, I had the idea for the best science fair project ever. It was a robot that, if you shine a light on it, it would move. And, you know, it used this newfangled thing called a photocell. And I just knew I was going to win the science fair. 
Well, I didn't even place. I mean, there was uh, the top 50, and then the next 50, I was in the next 50. And I, could, I was beside myself. I couldn't figure out why couldn't I win this science fair with this great robot. And the, uh, one of the judges stopped by uh, when I was standing next to my robot crying. And all my classmates were teasing me because I had told all of them I was going to win. One of the judges stopped by and he said, it's simple. You didn't use the scientific method. You've got to state a hypothesis. You've got to design a, an experiment to test the hypothesis, execute that experiment, and then produce the results. And because it was such a profound disappointment, that knowledge was seared on my brain. I really understood the scientific method from that point on, and I ended up using it for the rest of my career, practically using it for everything, every situation that I encountered. I would formulate a hypothesis and I would say, okay. So it really didn't matter when I started to approach things that way, whether I achieved my objective or not, because I would, as long as I understood why I didn't achieve the objective, I would learn something. Bernie talked about, you know, why we celebrate Black History Month, well, again, I looked at this business experience as an experiment because in the time that we came along, I say we, I'm, I'm being presumptuous maybe about Bertie and Norman, but at the time we came along, all this stuff was new. You know, I didn't see anybody starting a business in their basement, a, techno a technology business. I didn't see anybody black or white doing that, but I certainly didn't see any black folks doing that. And so when we started this business, one of the reasons we started was to see if we could. And so this book I wrote is my thesis, and I had to do it in a very methodical and detailed way. I tried to make it interesting, but the reason I wrote it was to let people know not only what's possible, but actually what happened in detail. Because so often, we see the end result. We see somebody who's been successful and they're all dressed up nice and, you know, they speak well and so forth. But you don't see all the stuff that happened behind the scenes. So I want to just take a few minutes, if I have a few minutes, and tell you some of the stuff that happened behind the scenes uh, that resulted in the success that uh, we had in business. Uh, so I went to a school called General Motors Institute for a couple of years left there because I couldn't see myself working at General Motors for the next umpteen years. I wanted to get into communications. So I went to University of Michigan, got a bachelor's degree, master's degree in electrical engineering, and uh, I only wanted to work at one place. I wanted to work at at and Bell Labs because that was the place you heard about when you're a student or even before. You're, you know, a transistor was invented there. We studied something in school called, called uh, Shannon's channel capacity theorem. And Shannon was a researcher at Bell Labs. And you look at, you design Bodhi plots when you're in school. Bodhi was uh, a Bell Labs person. So I just wanted to work for Bell Labs. And it was, I tell young people today because young people don't know anything about Bell Labs. Uh, they know about Google. So I say Bell Labs was Google, Microsoft, you know, Sun, Microsystem, everything rolled into one in those days. Bell Labs was the place to be. Well, fortunately, you know, I had been planning to start a business for some time. I had always wanted to start a business since my college days. I used to tell people that my goal was to start a business, sell it at 40 years old, and then go study anthropology. And so uh, I had different schemes and different business plans that I had worked on even as I was working at Bell Labs. And somewhere along the line, uh, I enticed two of my co-workers uh, from my first group, uh, two African-American guys. One was a Georgia Tech Morehouse Stanford grad, and the other guy was a University of South Carolina grad uh, who got his uh, uh, master's in the OYOC program at Rutgers. I enticed both of these guys to come work with me because they were walking to the cafeteria one day, and I didn't know quite how to say it to them. But so I just blurted out. I said, I got an idea that it's going to make us all millionaires. And so when we got to lunch, they sat out and they listened <laughs> intently. And I described this device that we could build, which was really a device for simulating the characteristics of the telephone network. 
uh, and it was to be used to test modems and faxes and other kinds of communication devices. Well, um, when my second project got canceled and things just looked so uh, uncertain at AT&T, I quit and uh, started working full time in the basement. And some of my coworkers asked, you know, among themselves, did he go crazy? Did he have a nervous breakdown? You know, nobody ever leaves Bell Labs to go start a business in their basement. Um, but for me, starting a business uh, in those days was an extension of the civil rights struggle in my mind. I wanted to see if we could do it. You know, not just could I do it, but could we do it? And so uh, even though it was an extremely difficult uh, undertaking and very uncertain, uh, I was determined to do it in those days. But I wasn't uh, a very sophisticated business person. I was a decent engineer, um, but I gave an example of my lack of sophistication in business. I needed to get some money to start this business. So I took my prototype of this telephone network simulator. It was about that wide and about this big. I put it in the passenger seat of my Volkswagen Scirocco, and I drove over to uh, a bank branch of just a local bank. I drove up to the drive-up window. <laughs> and the clerk looked out, and she looked at, you know, I could have had a car full of watermelons for all she knew. But uh, she said, can I help you? I said, yes, I have my prototype here. I, I need some money to start a business. And she said, well, why don't you come inside? <laughs> So I parked the car. I said, first I said, should I bring my prototype with me? She said, no, that won't be necessary. <laughs> so I parked the car. I went in, and there was a young guy who was the, uh, I guess, the branch manager. And uh, he said that all they do is home loans. They don't do business loans at this. It was a, it was a bank branch. It wasn't even a, you know, a bank. Uh, so undaunted. I said, okay, I'm going to the source. I got in my car, I drove down to Washington, D.C. I went to the SBA headquarters because I had heard that the Small Business Administration was giving loans and especially wanted to give loans to minority companies. I go in, I meet somebody there. They look at me like I'm crazy. Why are you coming to SBA? Uh, but they gave me a few pamphlets and they referred me to the Newark office and they told me about something called a guaranteed loan program. Well, uh, I uh, took that to heart. I came back. I had this accountant who I met because when I registered my business, you know how people send you, uh, you know, solicitations? Well, I thought that he knew me and, you know, he wanted me to, wanted to be my accountant. So I signed him up. He's my accountant. He said, I know somebody in North Jersey who's, who can give you a loan under the SBA Guaranteed Loan Program. I've done it before. He's done it before. He said, it'll be no problem. We get in his car. We go up to North Jersey. This guy, we walk in his office. He takes one look at me. His face scrunches up like that look that you get when people are not expecting you to be black. And it was a very short meeting. He hardly looked at me or talked to me. He talked to his accountant friend. On the way back down in the car, this guy said, Dave, I don't understand. This guy's done this a lot before. He told me it'd be no problem. But I understood what was going on. Well, at any rate, uh, I took from that experience the knowledge that some bank would probably give me a loan. So I found a bank uh, locally called Midlantic. They used to call themselves the Hungry Bankers. Uh, I don't think they exist anymore. But uh, they gave me a loan for $150,000. Uh, it was prime plus two. Prime rate was 11% in those days, so the loan was 13%. Uh, it was secured to my house and personal guarantees from me and my wife, who was also working at AT&T. So the bank had very little risk, uh, but we really didn't care. I didn't care because I felt like if the business succeeded, I'd pay off the loan quickly, and if the business didn't succeed, it wasn't going to matter that we paid, you know, such a high interest rate. Well, as I said, I was not very sophisticated. Uh, that first year, um, it was tough getting started. Our first few customers were at AT&T. We went back to our friends and said, you know, here's the device you said you needed. It's better than anything out there. Will you buy it? We had a few people buy it. And uh, uh, 
But then we had to try to get beyond AT&T. Uh, and there were points during that first year when we wished we would just fail. And then we could go back to Bell Labs, get our jobs back, and sit down in a lunchroom and tell everybody the adventures we had, you know, trying to start this business. Um, well, toward the end of that year, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Victor Lawrence who was running a modem group. And a few years earlier, when I had my first supervisor job, I noticed that uh, his name came up for promotion. And most of the people in the room said, you know, this guy is not really supervisor material. He was at the top of the performance ladder. PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, he's from Ghana originally. He had gone to school in London. I don't know where he got his PhD. I think London University is where he got his PhD. Really sharp guy. Top of the performance ladder. Everybody acknowledged. Not ready for promotion. I said, okay, I'm a new supervisor. I don't really understand this. The next year, same thing happened. I went to the director. I said, this doesn't seem right. This guy's top of the performance ladder. Why isn't he promotable? Well, they say he doesn't have the fire in his belly. Well, why don't we ask him? And so anyway, make a long story short, he ultimately got promoted. And uh, so by the time I was starting his business, he was a supervisor. We were really uh, close to going broke toward the end of our first year. I got a call from Victor. And Victor said, hey, Dave, I think I need one of your products. And I said, oh, that's great, Victor. Uh, he said, tell me what I need. So you need a TAS 1010 telephone network simulator. It costs $16,950. Fill out the PO, send it to us. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I have a lot of money I need to spend before the end of the year. I think I need more than one. <laughs> well, by the end of the conversation, Victor had bought five of these telephone network simulators that cost about 17 grand each, what's that, $85,000 in one order. And in those days, that was a lot of money. Uh, and that really got us through that first year. Uh, and I don't know if he was uh, feeling grateful for the fact that I had stood up for him years earlier, or he just saw some, some entrepreneurs who were trying to make it and wanted to support them, or he really needed all these products. He ended up using them all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was a life-saving uh, situation for us. I also want to say on the internal side of the business, things were tough. Um, we uh, would have to go out and hire people in this little three or four person company. You know, we weren't in my basement anymore, but our first location after the basement was called the Red Bank Mini Mall. We were in the basement. On one side was a tanning salon. On the other side was a travel agency. At the other end of the hall was a, for entertainment was a modeling school. Uh, so we were in this little 800 square foot place and we're trying to hire people. Well, we'd put ads in the Asbury Park Press and people would come. Well, we didn't understand at that time that the people you get through that process are not necessarily going to be your best people. So we had some really interesting experiences. I have a chapter in the book that I call Nuts, Misfits, and Rejects. Uh, <laughs> But that, that summarizes kind of my feeling at the time. Uh, we hired an a, uh, administrative assistant and a manufacturing manager, both of them young people. Uh, we went to a trade show in 1986 in Atlanta. We get back from the trade show. Two days later, there are two letters on my chair in the morning. Both of them resigned. Now, we had five employees. Two of them resigned. That's a pretty big hit to any company. Uh, but they just got disgruntled because they were asked to go to this trade show, which I thought was an honor. And they thought that they were somehow being, their freedom was being limited. They were young people. Maybe they had other plans. Uh, so they quit. Then I hired a, uh, a bookkeeper. And uh, she was tremendous for the first couple of uh, months. But then she started getting sloppy, started missing days. Um, and one day, she was out, and the American Express, uh, what they call management report, came in, and the receptionist brought it to my desk, and I look at it, and I see some charges from, a charge from the fashion bug. <laughs> and I said, I don't remember any business expenses at the fashion bug. And so I called my uh, partner in, and he went and got his thing, and he had some bogus charges on his, too. Well, long story short, uh, she was forging signatures and stealing money from us. 
That was the end of our bookkeeper. We hired a manufacturing manager to replace this young guy, and this guy was tremendous. He was a Brooklyn guy, older guy, really experienced, um, just uh, did more than just manufacturing. He did the purchasing as well. Well, one afternoon, I get a report. This guy's out on the shipping dock trying to field the breasts of the shipping receiving clerk. And, you know, we just hired this guy. We needed a manufacturing manager. <laughs> but I couldn't have a sexual predator as a, so we, got, we had to get rid of him. Then we hire our first software development person. I was very excited about this because up until that time, I was a software development person, and I wanted to get out of that. So we hired a young Asian woman who was really sharp. I think she went to Rutgers, um, sat down with her. She understood immediately what needed to be done, started doing good work. Two weeks later, I go in to sit down and go over where things stand with her. Uh, I notice she's a little nervous and jumpy during the meeting. I get up to go. She hands me a letter. <laughs> Two weeks! And so it turns out that she had gotten an offer from Bell Communications Research. Uh, so why would I want to work for your crappy little company when I got this job from Bell Communications? So this is the kind of thing that we had uh, going on. And uh, we really did some soul searching after that. Uh, my my uh, co-founders, Steve, Charles, and I, we sat down. Because every time somebody left, we would, we would try to figure out, except in the case of the predator, <laughs> we would try to figure out, is it us or is it them? And um, so uh, we really decided that we needed to change our whole approach to finding people uh, and to keeping people. And we really needed to market ourselves as just what we were, a small company with a lot of opportunity. You develop something today. Six months later, is going out the back door. It's not like in the old days where you develop something and might or might not ship. Um, you're going to see the results of what you do in this company. You're very important to this company. Everything is under this roof. You walk back here, here's where manufacturing is. You walk over here, here's where development is. If you want that kind of experience, this is the place to be. If you don't want that kind of experience, you know, go work for at and <laughs> And so we were able to filter uh, people and find people who were suitable for our environment, and we started uh, building up the company and having some success. And uh, I came to a different appreciation uh, of the whole racial issue as a result of being in business. And one of the things, the most important things I found was that race is always a factor in interactions between people, between people of different races. I hired a sales rep firm uh, to help with our sales outside of the local area because we were trying to expand our sales. These were white guys um, because all the sales rep firms at that time in electronics were white guys. The first meeting we had, um, one of the guys said to me, Dave, we're just like whores. I want you to understand. You don't have to like us. We don't have to like you. Our job is to get in, get out, and get paid, just like horse. I said, that's an interesting uh, <laughs> analogy, metaphor, sales hose. OK. So um, we hired these guys. And on one of the first uh, sales calls up in the Boston area, I'll never forget, it was a company called Concord Data Systems. We go in, and there's a guy there, where there's a, a group of guys, and I'm giving a demo of our product. And there's this one guy in a biker outfit. Uh, there was actually one black guy there. He was actually the chief engineer at this company. But there was a group of white guys, and one guy who had this biker outfit on. And as I'm giving the demo and soliciting questions, he keeps just, you know, nudging me, just, you know, being a hard ass, you know, and, and to make it uh, simple. Um, asking annoying questions, and when I answered them, he would say, whatever feature we had wasn't important and he always needed something else. So I was just losing it. It was one of my first sales calls that wasn't at and wasn't people that I knew. And I'm sweating and I'm, you know. So at one point, I just lose. I say, why did you have us come here? And he said, I don't know. We ordered your competitor's product two weeks ago. And at that point, I'm, 
you know, my fists are falling up. And so uh, the sales rep said, wait a minute. You ordered the competitor's product? The competitor was called AEA. He didn't say the competitor's product. You ordered AEA's product already? The guy said, yeah. So the rep looked at him again and said, when are they going to deliver it? And uh, the biker guy said, uh, well, I don't know. They say they're all backed up. He said, if uh, TAS can deliver you this product in two weeks, will you get it from us? And the guy said, yeah, we probably would. We got the sale. <laughs> and so what that told me, and I, I had this occur so many times, so many other times, race was clearly a factor. It was a factor for me, <laughs> and I think it was a factor for him. But it wasn't the main factor. It wasn't the deciding factor in that uh, interaction. And you learn in sales that uh, there are objections. There are always objections. Nobody just wants to buy something. Everybody wants to throw something up there and have you deal with it. Well, race is like another one of those objections. And we had to overcome that in order to get the sale. In the case of employees, we had to justify ourselves to our employees. Why should you work for us instead of somebody else? In the case of our suppliers, we had to justify ourselves to them. Why should you break your neck to get this product to me on time, small company, when you could spend your time servicing a larger company? So, you know, we probably had to do more of that than a larger company would do, or maybe a white-owned company would do. But the fact that we had to do that made us better business people, and we were always ready for it. You know, it's kind of like uh, if you play basketball and you play with... Uh, five pound ankle weights, <laughs> your legs get strong. And if you ever take the ankle weights off, you know, you're Michael Jordan. You know, we grew the company and by late, late 80s, we were over six million dollars in sales, which at that time was, you know, good money. Um, but then in the early 90s, around the time of the Gulf War, we had a downturn. And our sales really leveled off, our profits almost went to zero, um, and we really didn't know what to do. So I went to see somebody at Bell Labs by the name of Victor Lawrence. By this time, Victor is a director. He's been named an AT&T Fellow. You know, this is the guy who wasn't ready for a promotion. Uh, so at any rate, I sat down with Victor. And, and, you know, we had these discussions every six months or so. I said, Victor, you know, we really need to come up with a new product. What do you think we should do? And uh, he said, well, what you need to do is go into wireless. Wireless is big, it's getting bigger. You know, at that time, everybody had the amps phone. Uh, but he saw what was on the horizon, and he said, you really need to do this. I said, Victor, I don't know how we're going to do it. We don't have any wireless expertise in-house. Uh, I really don't understand the applications. He said, well, my friend David Goodman at Rutgers University is giving a seminar in a couple weeks. I think you need to go to that seminar. So I went. I learned all about wireless technology at a high level. I learned what was needed in terms of test instrumentation, a device that simulated the propagation effects uh, that you, uh, you have in a mobile environment, whether you're traveling in a car or walking or on a plane. Uh, the signal fading that occurs needed to be uh, simulated repeatedly in a laboratory environment. So we said, ah, we have a product we can do. And so uh, ultimately, we did that. Um, and to make a long story short, the company took off uh, in the wireless arena. The company today is still in Edentown. Uh, it's a, div a division of a company that we sold to in 1995. My second in command uh, is now the president, and the other second in command is the senior vice president of research and development. Last year, they did $100 million. Uh, and uh, within the next month or so, they're going to cross a billion dollars in cumulative sales. Uh, and this is from three guys who started this business in the basement and weren't necessarily so sophisticated. <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, I want to uh, just read you a couple of paragraphs from the end of the book, and this will be the end of my presentation. It's not the end of the book, it's near the end. But it talks about, it, it illustrates uh, how uh, I thought, and I think my partners thought too, that our business was more than just a business. It was a cause. Uh, we had just sold the company, and we were leaving our attorney's offices. And for the first time, 
we were uh, independently wealthy. What's the term? Um, I guess that's the term. We didn't have to work <laughs> if we didn't want to. Uh, and that, that was really uh, a special day. I, I call it Independence Day. Um, and so uh, uh, this, these few paragraphs deal with what happened after we signed all the papers and uh, were leaving the office. So it says, uh, our business complete, the parties filtered from the room. Sarah, the buyer's attorney, left immediately and unceremoniously to return to New York. Paul and Beatrice, our investment bankers, also headed back to the city. Phil, our lawyer, walked down the hall to his office. Steve, Charles, and I drove separately back to TAS to give our employees and friends the good news. We had a lot of shareholders in the company. I was euphoric as I settled into my car. I popped in my latest Stevie Wonder CD and sang along. Rain your love down, won't you rain down your love? Let it drink just like the sun from above. As I turned on a Newman Springs Road, from Newman Springs Road, onto Shrewsbury Avenue, I was consumed by thoughts of my father. His intense interest in electronics created a fertile learning environment for me, and I had been intent on making the most of it. I grew up determined to prove it was a new day, that the forces that had frustrated my father's ambitions and limited his career would not stifle me. My father's dreams became my dreams, and his reality became my nightmare. Taken together, they were powerful motivators. Tears started streaming down my face, and I screamed, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah, I did it, pops, see, I did it. I always knew what financial independence meant, but had never felt it. Now I realized that unlike my father, I could do what I wanted, live where I wanted, raise and educate my kids the way I wanted. I was, to borrow a phrase, a man in full. I might have been a sight, a black man crawling along in his black Mercedes, screaming at the top of his lungs and crying at the same time. Luckily, no policeman spotted me, or I might have been arrested or worse, committed. <laughs> Oblivious of my surroundings, I didn't care who was watching. With each scream, I exercised the doubts and fears and uncertainty that had lurked inside since my Flint childhood. It was as if 30 years of pressure were released in a few moments. I had proved what I had set out to prove, that I, a black man, could establish and build a world-class technology business from scratch. I proved that the many sacrifices my parents made to enable my success were not in vain. I proved that the monumental civil rights struggle waged during my formative years made the difference between my father's bitter frustration and my own sweet elation. So many people worked and endured and marched and suffered and died during that movement, and their images were burned into my young psyche. I proved that those people didn't work and endure and march and suffer and die for nothing. Their battleground became my proving ground. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was very, very, very insightful.